Okay, today, as Alan said, I'm going to be talking about the disastrous effects of stress on your brain. Because this is nothing to be belittled. We have to understand this. Because today I'm going to be talking about the effect of stress on the brain and how it affects it with respect to Alzheimer's. Right now, researchers are telling us that numbers are escalating. Right now in Canada, we have about 747,000 people afflicted with it. By 2031, they're predicting um, up to about 1.4 million of us will be affected. Alzheimer is the most common of dementias. Dementias is characteristically, um, you see it because people lack memory. They may become violent. They have behavioral changes for sure. But generally speaking, they go back to being a child. What's really important here is to realize that institutionalizing people in Canada is very, very expensive. So a lot of people, a lot of families, pretty much volunteer their time to take care of their family members who are afflicted with Alzheimer's and other dementias. We're talking about 44 million hours of unpaid work. And it's very draining, both financially and also emotionally, without reward. So by 2040, we're looking at 1.2 billion hours of unpaid labor. I already have a friend who abruptly retired from his, from his career, from his life's work, to go home and take care of his wife. She is a little bit older than me, but she has drank the Kool-Aid that she has got Alzheimer's and she can never ever look back. And I'm t here today to tell you that there is a ton of stuff that we can do because their research also says that Alzheimer's is in the top 10 killers, it's number four, and they are saying that Alzheimer's cannot be prevented, it can't be slowed down, and it can't be cured. Well, I totally, emphatically disagree, and that's because, that's because things are different, okay? I'm probably not even going to go with my, my slides right now because I don't believe that any of this is true simply because we have all this wonderful research in neuropsychology, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, neuroscience, which is sitting there just gathering dust because they don't understand how to use it. So we're spending trillions of dollars on all this wonderful research, but it's not being applied. So because of my own research and clinical experience, I have found out what happens when somebody who comes to me, it doesn't matter what their injury is, but when I discovered through my research of the brain that by changing your thoughts, your emotional state, that you feel better physically. This is a mind and body connection that scientists refuse to talk about because this is about true mind-body connection. So I don't think they're right. There is no inevitability. We have control as human beings. Each one of us can make choices. And I am so passionate and I have so much conviction about spreading this message and that is why I am here today and why I am so grateful that Alan and I bumped into each other more than a year ago. So why listen to me? I am an expert on the brain, on brain health. 
And I have been across this country and also coast to coast in the United States spreading a message on both stage and on television to talk about the proactive things that we can do in order to heal concussions. So this is my connection to brain injury. I have been on stage with Brain Injury Canada three times in the past two years in order to speak about the proactive things that we can do about brain injury. And I want you to think about Alzheimer's as a brain injury. And I am going to prove that to you later on as we speak, OK? Because the things that happen, the results that you get with a brain injury from an actual blow to the head to what stress does to you are the same, are the same. And I've also been able, I've also written three books in the past two years through my research and through my clinical practice about healing concussions. I have a proactive healing process that anybody can use, anyone. I have taught hundreds of my clients in their worst and most painful and traumatic times of their lives to come back and live a full life. And it's because they changed their attitude towards themselves. Whenever we get sick, whenever we are diseased, it is because we don't think we can cope with life. This is what stress does to us. Stress is really thinking, believing that we are weak and we are not. We just need to find out how to proceed within our lives so that we can be as powerful and as strong as we desire. That is the mind-body connection. And so that leads me to a story of a very young man. And he called me up one night and he said, I was hit so hard in the head that I actually went blind. And then he proceeded to tell me his story. So he was playing soccer, and he was on his side of the field, when unbeknownst to him, his teammate on the other side kicked the ball towards him. Well, he was over here doing what he's supposed to be doing. So he had no idea that the ball was coming. He wasn't ready for it, and so he was struck really hard on the side of his head. He went down, and then, as usual, when, when something like this happens, his teammates gathered him up and took him over to the sidelines. Well, while he was sorting things out, he realized as he was opening his eyes, he couldn't see. He couldn't see. The horror, the terror. What do you think he was thinking about at that moment? All of a sudden, his life changed just like that. So he waited. He probably prayed. He doesn't know how long he was sitting there, but thank God his eyesight eventually came back. And then he made a decision. He went back on the soccer field. He went back because it was a hot day. This is late summer. His team was shorthanded that day. He felt, even though he felt terrible, even though he felt that he couldn't do anything out there, the least he could do was stand out there like a pylon so his teammates could sub on and off and get a break. So that's what he did until the end of the game. And then he drove himself home. And that's when the headaches started, the pounding headaches. He knew right away he had a concussion. Nobody had to tell him. So he decided, OK, I'm going to take care of this. Uh, he, he cut out all his extra, extracurricular activities, and he would rest whenever he could. The one thing he could not do, because he was an intermediate engineer, he couldn't stop going into work because he had tons of work on his plate. There's no way that he could stay home. 
no way. So he continued to work. By the time he called me, more than two weeks later, everything had gone from bad to worse. So now he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, so much for resting. He had no appetite, and he had headaches almost all the time. He knew that eventually his work performance was going to suffer, and suffer badly. I've heard of many people who had to quit their jobs, who had had to downgrade their ambition because they couldn't get this solved. Okay? So at the end of it, he, he asked me, can you help me? This young man is my oldest son, Nolan. And I want to back up about 10 years before that to give you some context. In another <coughs> frantic call 10 years earlier, so he doesn't call mom very often, he, he was very upset. At the time, he was going to school at the U of A, studying engineering, and I was down in Calgary studying traditional Chinese medicine. And he told me that he had just found out that a good friend of his had committed suicide. Apparently, this young man had been told that his father was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And so, this young man just decided one day to step in front of an LRT train, and he killed himself. And my son asked me, Mom, why would he do this? Why would he kill himself? And I thought about it, and I said, you know, Nolan, his father's diagnosis was not what made him kill himself. He probably had so many different things all along the way that made him so unhappy that when he found out about his father's diagnosis, that just tipped him right over. And that's when he decided to end it. And then I said, Nolan, your, your mom and dad are always here with you. I want you to come and talk to us whenever you have any problem. And don't ever give up. So that night when he asked me for help, of course I said yes. And then I said, you have to do every single thing that I tell you to do. And my God, there were some things that I asked him to do, which I'll talk about in the workshop later, that were going to challenge him, that were going to kick him out of his comfort zone, that, were so, that was going to be so difficult. But he did it anyways because he made a promise, not to me, but to himself, that he was going to be well again. So that was late August. We started working early September. October, he was back at light practices with his team. No, no heading. By November 2nd, he started the regular season on time in indoor soccer. All winter long, he skied in the Canadian Rockies. He played soccer. He played in his pool league. And he never missed a day of work. It's been over three and a half years now. He's never had a relapse. No headaches. No depression. No eye problems. He is living his life exactly the way he wants to. So you're here if you're sleep deprived, if you're suffering from foggy brain, if you're suffering from acid reflux or upset stomach, if you're experiencing weight loss or weight gain and frequent headaches. This and many other things are signs of stress. And like I said earlier, there's all this great research in neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, neuroscience that is not being used. It's not being used. So I'll go back <laughs> to another slide. But the thing is, is that there are new risk factors for Alzheimer's. 
because we used to think that old age was the only criteria. We used to say that uh, if you had family background in Alzheimer's, then for sure you would get it. But research has shown us that only 5% of people with Alzheimer's today have a background, a family background of it. Only 5%. So family background and genetics has nothing to do with it. So what are the new factors? The new factors include cardiovascular health and your brain health. There's a relationship between those two. There's a relationship between your general overall health condition and brain health. So if your general health isn't so good, you better be thinking about this now. And the thing is, is that Alzheimer's is now happening in younger and younger age groups, mostly because of the onset of a brain injury, such as a concussion. So knowing what I know now, because this, didn't, this sort of thing didn't come out when I was treating my son, knowing what I know now, I really understand why it was so important for me to have my my own son being treated by me. Because to me, the thing is, is that Brain Injury Canada says that every three minutes, someone in this country is getting a brain injury. Now that's through sports, just walking down the street, motor vehicle accidents, you know, so getting whiplash can, can give you a concussion or a brain injury of some sort. So today, I'm going to be talking about the nervous system in very general terms. But what's most important for you to know? Why stress matters, oops, <laughs> why stress matters, and how you learn, or what neuroplasticity really means. I'll also be talking about how to become stronger and more self-assured, again, so that you can deal with any crisis today and in the future, because that is so important. So we have to look outside the box. That's why you have to get used to, to the idea that Alzheimer's is really a brain injury. So is it possible to mistake a brain injury for the flu? Several years ago, some of you may remember a Calgary Flames player named Ray Bork. Um, he had a great future here, or so they thought. When one day the Calgary Flames announced that they had traded Ray Bork to the Montreal Canadiens. And everybody was shocked. The me sports media was shocked, the fans were shocked, but even more shocked was Ray Bork because he really loved being in Calgary. He thought he had a great future here. So some weeks after he had traded, started playing with Montreal, I decided, you know, just to look him up and see what was going on. And apparently, I found out that he was diagnosed with a concussion. So that's not unusual. You'll hear stories about this from pro sports almost every week. But what is interesting is the back story. Because Ray Bork went to see his team doctors when he wasn't feeling very good. And so they looked him over and they thought, yeah, you got the flu. You know, just go home, take this get better when you come, you know, come back when you get better. Well, some days later, he went back to see the doctors and he wasn't getting any better. So they decided to dig a little deeper. Well, they discovered that he had all the symptoms of a concussion. So, okay, maybe that's not surprising either. What was surprising was nobody could remember how he got it. There was no blow to the head when he was playing, when he was at practice, at home, nothing, nothing. But they diagnosed him with a concussion and he was put on an indefinite injury list. At the beginning of this NHL season, another player called Mark Metot of the Ottawa Senators, he went to see his doctors his team doctors. He too did not feel very good. They thought, okay, you got the flu, go home, we'll see you in a few days. After a few days he came back, I'm not feeling good. I mean, it, something's wrong. 
So they looked at him more closely too. And to their surprise, they found he had concussion. So you don't need a blow to the head to have a brain injury. Okay, I'm going to be talking about the nervous system, a little bit about the brain, and about the central nervous system, and mostly on the autonomic nervous system, which is your so-called automatic nervous system. So this is your neocortex. Your neocortex is the largest part of your brain. This is your center of conscious awareness, where you make your decisions, uh, where you make your judgments. It's the brain that sets us apart from most other animals on this earth. It's, it's the one thing that is so important in our lives because we need our brain, okay? So it's divided up into four lobes. The frontal lobe is right here by your forehead. And this is where your conscious awareness is. This is where you make your decisions, your judgment calls. It also controls many of the functions of your brain. The parietal lobe on the top is just above the ears. So that takes care of touch and feeling, of your body position, and some language functions. Your occipital lobe is in the back of your head. It uh, takes care of your vision and, and what it, how it interprets what you see. Your temporal lobe has very many important roles in your life. Okay, so it takes care of your hearing, your smelling, your perception, learning, memory. Remember, this is where my son was hit, okay? And um, also some language functions. So this is the largest part of the brain, but the part of the brain that I feel is even more important is called your limbic brain, and this is your emotional and chemical brain. The reason why it's called the chemical brain is because of this little guy right here the hypothalamus. Your, your limbic brain is only about this big, but it feeds the cortex, okay? So that's why this little part of the brain, to me, is the most important. Those chemicals that the hypothalamus uh, creates are the neurotransmitters. So these are the things like dopamine, serotonin, you've probably heard about these chemicals, and the limbic brain on the whole also has a lot to do with the stress response in your body. But you're going to find out that this is so important. <laughs> the hippocampus is a very small part of the brain, and this little thing is responsible for your learning ability, your memories, for, um, for emotions, it's the place where it decides whether this memory is a short-term memory or whether it's a long-term memory. It's the one that divvies up all your memories to different parts of your cortex, okay? So I'm going to be talking about a lot more about this in the next section. Now we come to the autonomic nervous system, which is your automatic nervous system. And these are all the systems that it takes care of, okay? So you don't have to tell your body to breathe. You don't have to tell your heart to beat. If you're a woman, you didn't have to tell your body to make this baby. The body takes care of it all. It doesn't, you don't have to tell your liver to go through all these millions of chemical reactions that it needs to go through every single day. But we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight nervous system. This is what happens when um, stress is set off, okay? So the thing is, is that the brain does not differentiate between real and imagined. This is 
definitely the definition of what a worry is. So you can imagine something that might happen, and if it's not something that is good, you're going to feel bad. So that's the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system will kick in after a while if things are normal, and then you calm down. So it sends chemicals such as oxytocin over your brain and your body to calm you down. Okay, now, why does stress matter? My definition of stress is very easy. It's simply prolonged chronic negative outlook. So the longer that you have a bad feeling about your life, as long as you keep replaying the things that might happen or have happened in the past that you did not enjoy, you are creating stress in your body. So it's true. We don't need to have a saber-toothed tiger chasing us through the forest in order to be stressed out. As long as we keep thinking about the things that we don't like, as long as we keep focusing on the things that we do not like, you will have a stress-filled brain and body. Because stress is real pain. It's not imaginary. It's pain. And when you have pain in your mind, it will manifest somewhere in a weak part of your body. For my son, his brain was weakened by what he was concerned about. So that's the way to look at things. Why does the brain become weak? Why does someone get Alzheimer's and someone does not? Why does the brain get weak? So I'll talk about a couple of trends in modern research. They are finally beginning to understand some of the things that classical Chinese medicine has known for millennia that your psychological well-being is intimately tied to your physical well-being. All of your emotions, all of your emotional states is going to influence your body and your brain. Good, better, best, ugly, bad, or worse. It's your choice. So these are signs of a stressed out mind and body connection. OK, let me explain it this way. When you get angry, your heartbeat goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your, your digestive system shuts down. This is the mind-body connection. Because every thought that you have is neutral until you apply an emotion to it. Then you have an opinion about it. And it happens in a split second, in a nanosecond. It doesn't take long. Because usually we have these built-in habits uh, about our attitude about certain things. So if we see something that we don't like, automatically it sets off a whole bunch of different reactions within our body. And if it really gets you upset, like maybe talking about politics, you know, for some of us, you know, arguments and all that. You know, like, you know, this is what happens. It sets off a whole bunch of different stress reactions. Okay, so we're back at the hypothalamus. So let's say you hear something, you see something, you, um, something that makes you upset. Right away, you get a stress response. So the hypothalamus sends a signal down to the autonomic nervous system, basically the uh, sympathetic nervous system. And it talks to the adrenal gland, OK? So it tells the adrenal gland, OK, start secreting adrenaline. And at the same time, the hypothalamus is also talking to the pituitary gland, which is also a very small part of the limbic brain. 
And so the pituitary gland sends other signals down to another part of the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, which will secrete cortisol, okay? And so then we get the elevated blood pressure, you know, the fast heartbeat maybe in this case. Our digestion definitely shuts down. And we have, and then we react, okay? So now after what usually normally happens, if everything is good, is that eventually your parasympathetic nervous system will kick in because the hippocampus is talking to the hypothalamus. The hippocampus actually monitors the level of cortisol in your bloodstream. And it will tell the hypothalamus, okay, you can stop now. We're at this level. You can stop now. It's okay. We can calm down now. And so then we get other things like oxy oxytocin coming into our body, which will calm us right down. Now, this can happen in a few minutes. So this is normal. So if it's taking you longer than, you know, maybe three minutes to calm down, you better be thinking about what's happening, okay? So this is what a normal brain looks like compared to an Alzheimer's brain. There's quite a bit of shrinkage there. I already told you that the hippocampus is responsible for memory, for learning, and for, um, and for emotions because of the stress reaction, right? Uh, so it calms us down. But I didn't tell you that it's also the main place in the brain, this tiny little part of the brain. This is where most of our new brain cells are made. This is where our, most of our new brain cells are made. So what happens here is we, so it divvies up any, any of your memories as whether it's short-term or long-term. So a short-term memory is like um, your grocery list. You know, as soon as you knock off everything, you bought all that stuff, then you just throw it away. So that's short-term. Long-term memories are your, your name, remembering your kids' names, your address, your cell phone number, hopefully your wedding anniversary for some of you here. And um, so those are considered long term. So the hippocampus decides where do these memories go in your brain, where those long term memories go, okay? But the thing is, is that you need to have short term memory before you can have long term memories. And so what happens in Alzheimer's? People don't have very good short term memory. And so what happens in something like, uh, like somebody who's had a brain injury in a car accident, your short-term memory goes. And the other thing about Alzheimer's is that behavioral changes can, can happen because the person doesn't really, maybe they don't understand what's going on and they get frustrated and angry and they get violent. This is also what happens in a brain injury under normal circumstances, too. So that's why there's definitely a parallel here. Definitely a parallel. So stress causes brain injury because it impairs the brain. So your memories really make a difference. Your experiences make a difference because Stress affects your memory. It makes you stupid. So when you're trying to make a, an important decision, doing it while you're un, intensely unha unhappy is not a good time to be making an important decision because you can't think straight. I had a client who had suspected trigeminal neuralgia. So this is really bad pain in the jaw and the face area. She was a teacher. She was a single parent with three lovely daughters that she had done a fantastic job with. And when we first met in our intake, she said her husband was gone. So I thought maybe that was her way of telling me that he was dead. 
But as we got to know each other, she confessed that he was still alive, but he had had a, a very bad accident and that he became a totally different man. He was unable to care for the family. He was institutionalized. But she lived with a lot of regret. She felt abandoned. She felt angry. She felt sad and grief all at the same time. And in this part of the face runs what is called the large intestine meridian, okay, all the way from here down here. And I could tell just by looking at where it was, where the pain was, and it was happening on this side too, that all that grief and anger and feeling of abandonment, it was all lodged here. Part of it was because she could not speak of it. So now she found she could not speak. She was losing her ability to speak. And as a teacher, you are paid to speak. There was no way that she could not speak. And because her MDs couldn't figure out what was really wrong with her, they couldn't do anything for her. And then one day she found me. So as we worked together, we worked on releasing that past, releasing her worries, looking forward, living right here, being appreciative of what she had. I mean, there was acupuncture, there was hers, but there was a lot of teaching and a lot of learning on her part. She was changing her thoughts, which changed her emotional state. She had made a decision. The day when she told me that, Dr. Joni, I want this problem solved once and for all, it was music to my ears because she made a promise, not to me, but to herself. She also had this little problem where she was very sensitive to fragrances, so she could not walk down uh, the grocery aisle and the detergent aisle. She couldn't do that because it was too strong. She couldn't have her students wearing uh, cologne or perfume around her. She couldn't have it. She was definitely able to speak, again, very comfortably. She could walk down that detergent aisle, no fear anymore. She was living her life again. She was having fun. These are the changes that are made when you have made up your mind that you're not going to allow life to overwhelm you. And then you do something about it. Another trend in modern research is about optimists. Optimistic people overcome obstacles. Do we have any optimists in here? Naturally, fantastic. Because even with optimistic people, I mean, I was naturally optimistic too. After being in corporate for 24 years, I, I had this cancer scare, which turned my optimism into a lot of pessimism, and it could have killed me. But thank God, I made the necessary changes that had to be made, and that's why I do what I do today. So optimistic people are grateful, they're generous, they hang out with upbeat people. They ignore naysayers. They're more successful. They persevere, and they have general better health. So think about the new risk factors that I talked about. You need to consider that overall health, OK? It's kind of interesting, because when, even when you're reading modern psychology and they're talking about the stress response, they talk about the body sensing the stressor and immediately then going into the stress reaction. And I find that really strange because, I mean, when we're talking about psychology, we should be talking about the mind. Why are we talking, why are they talking about the body's reaction? No, it's our reaction. It's our thought that comes out, the feeling that comes out. That's what we should be talking about. We should be talking about what our mind perceives, what decision our mind has made, 
that's the, that's the source of either our stress or our happiness, which is our source of health or unhealth. So we want more dopamine. We, more, we want more oxytocin. We want more serotonin flowing in our bodies. So it's not, <laughs> it's not because we see something and our body reacts. No, it's because our mind reacts. Because dopamine flows when you take a step towards the goal. When you expect to be rewarded, when you are rewarded, and when you achieve your goal and you feel so damn good when you've done it. Serotonin flows when you feel important. This is self-confidence. It's self-confidence that will get you through the day. It's self-confidence that will tell you, no, I don't believe this is real. It's only a circumstance. I'm bigger than any circumstance. I will get through this. This is what an optimistic person will go through. Their science tells you that optimistic people are Pollyannas. They actually have the nerve to turn a positive trait in people into something negative. What kind of medicine is this that does not give you hope, that tells people like me that I am giving them false hope? It's bullshit. We need help. We need hope. We need to be optimistic because not, not a single one of you has achieved anything because you thought, I can't do this. Oh, you know, poor me. No, you believed that you could achieve this goal. You were optimistic. You were hopeful. And you just kept fighting. And you just kept going until you achieved that goal. A pessimist does not achieve goals. A pessimist does not dare to make mistakes or take risks. They never achieve anything. They die. They go to the end of their lives regretting that they never did something. I think you're all here because you are optimists. You're here to learn. You may be skeptical, but skeptical is good because you're curious and you want to learn more and you want to be successful and healthy and wealthy. No matter what is going on out there, I know it's terrible out there, I've been through it myself. I was in corporate for 24 years. My first layoff happened three and a half years into my own career as an engineer. I was very young then. And I went through a hell of a time. I totally ag identify with so much that's going out there. But I also have a history of being fired every three and a half years. <laughs> the longest time, I, the only, longest time I was ever on a staff job was for eight years. I totally get it. But that last time, I went out on my own terms. Because by then, I didn't care. I just did my job the best I could. If they laid me off, fired me, I didn't care anymore. Because I was very grateful instead to get that severance package at the end. You have to be practical, OK? So oxytocin flows from human touch, thinking and feeling about someone that you love and care about, and that better include yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to care about yourself. Because if you think that you can really love somebody else without really, truly loving yourself, you're not loving. You can only give what you have. So here are the signs of balanced mind-body connection. You're setting goals. You're looking forward, right? You're motivated. You take action. You're enthusiastic. You feel confident. You can think straight. Most importantly, you're resilient. And you have a great memory. So also the opposite of what Alzheimer's is like. So stress kills brain cells. Optimism heals brain cells. 
Stress kills brain cells because the thing about the hippocampus, like I said, it's, it's the place where most of your brain, new brain cells are made. The thing is, is that with chronic stress, you keep firing off uh, all, the brain, all these brain cells because they're inundated with um, cortisol, okay? So after a while, because they're, they get worn out from all this repeated firing off, those brain cells start dying off. And at the same time, it also inhibits the development, growth of new brain cells. So that's why the brain shrinks. Your brain shrinks when you're under a lot of stress. I would guarantee that anybody who has Alzheimer's today has had a very stressful life, a very unhappy one. And the spiritual reason for Alzheimer's is because, because I see this in people, is that they have spent their lives taking care of other people, giving their all to other people. But they did not spare a moment to themselves. I've seen this in examples of men and women. So I can understand why this is happening to them, because now they want to be taken care of. Going back to childhood, being unable to take care of oneself, or you're perceived to be unable to take care of yourself. So sometimes I wonder if, being, if having Alzheimer's is stressful for the person who's got it, but it is hell for the people who are around them, who care for them, who love them. It's hell for them. How you learn or what neuroplasticity really means. Here's some giant myths about the brain. Your brain is static when you get to a certain age. You only use 10% of your brain. Your left brain or your right brain. And you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I really don't understand where that came from. Okay, I think it's true for an old dog, but for people it's a choice. Because as long as you are having experiences and creating memories, your hippocampus will keep doing it. Except if you keep running around in your brain, the same old neural networks, okay, that say, I'm no good, I hate this job, blah, 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 all the complaining that we do. If you keep running those things over and over again, you're stressing yourself out and you are debilitating your brain. Okay, right now I can tell you that. The thing is, is that today we have the miracle of functional MRIs. So we can hook up electrodes to your head. We can ask you questions. You can complete a task. And we can see which parts of the brains are acting up. And so it's definitely a lot more than 10%. The thing about um, about your brain being static and that only 10% of your brain could be used and that your left brain or your right brain was better than the other one. All of that came about in the early 20th century when we couldn't look inside a live brain. We can do that now. We now know today that all parts of your brain are working all the time. Okay? We know that you can have all the brain growth that you want. You just have to decide. And we're using our right brain and our left brain as well all the time. So that's the good news. So you can repair and grow more brain cells, but we have to stop our most natural way of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking to repattern the brain. It's all, it all comes down to habits. It all comes down to habits, because habits are usually good for us because they save us time, okay? I mean, how many of you have a morning routine? You know, once you get out of bed, what do you do, right? So those, those things are good. But like I said, if we keep thinking about a certain 
team, you know, team person uh, on your team that you don't like, or you have a problem with your boss at work, or you have a problem uh, with a, a subordinate at work, and you keep talking, thinking about, you know, and saying the same things over and over again, that's a habit too. And it's doing you harm. It's doing you harm. This is my client, Derek. And he had anger issues. In fact, one day he was caught arguing over a parking spot in a parking lot in one of Calgary's malls with his wife sitting in the passenger seat. She was ready to dive under some rock because she was so embarrassed. But it changed for him the day when he lifted his hand to strike at his young son. And he stopped. And he knew, I've got to do something about this. I, I can't do this anymore. So he looked for help. He went to usual channels. He, um, he hired a psychotherapist. But for some reason, the psychotherapist kept telling him, well, you know, th these are books you should be reading. And he, and he said, I don't want to read books. I want help. So he just only got matter, OK? Then he found out about me. And we started working together and discovered that, oh, wow, you know, like, it, it, it really comes down to, self low, uh, to low self-esteem. This is what makes us think that we can't cope with what circumstances that life throws at us. We think we can't cope. We think we can't handle all these little hurdles. So he, he also had a number of mm, very strange uh, physical problems. Um, you know, he had uh, problems with his digestion. And he had these terrible sugar cravings in the form of coffee. He would be in his coffee lineups at Starbucks twice a day. And he was a manager. <laughs> twice a day at Starbucks, every day. That's what kept him going. And by the time we were finished working with each other, he had reduced his coffee to once a week as a date with his wife on the weekend. He no longer had sugar cravings because he was trying to bring sweetness into his life. He now had sweetness in his life. And I have seen this time and time again with my clients. Once they saw how great a person they really were, how accomplished they really were, how they finally appreciated who they really were and had something to look forward to, that they were strong, those sugar cravings went away. That's the real essence of a sugar craving, because we're trying to bring in something temporary that is sweet. But it's temporary. We have to find it within ourselves. So in order to learn or to create memories, you have to have continuous activation of a bunch of brain cells. And then these brain cells all get together, and they form a neural network. So that's an attitude, OK? You have to have strong emotional connection. This is how you remember. You don't remember anything if you don't have a strong emotional connection. So that's why our emotions are not to be denied. They are to be understood for what they're supposed to be there for. They either tell us that we love something or that we hate it. And if we hate it, then we change it. We change it. And you have to have lots of repetition in order to learn something. OK, so that takes us into here. Your brain was designed to learn and to unlearn. Because while you're learning something, you're also pruning away stuff that you don't need anymore. So you have to use your mind and your emotions to heal your brain. OK, so when we're learning something, you know, so we see something, it looks exciting. Oh, I want to do that. So your right brain gets activated, gets all lit up. And then at the same time, it goes to the left side, 
because we learn by mostly association. So your brain automatically goes over to the left side and finds something that's similar, okay? So it brings it over here. And so you keep repeating the same thing that you want to learn. You get excited over it. You're happy. You really want to do this. And at the same time, whatever you don't need gets pruned away. And you learn this new thing as long as you keep doing it, okay? So in the meantime, underneath the neocortex, the hippocampus is, okay, I'm, I'm, making, I'm making more brain cells. Okay, I'm doing this as fast as I can. I'm doing it. And it's happy, okay? When you are happy, your brain is happy, your body is happy. I know people talk about happiness, but the thing is, is that you've got to be content to save yourself from further harm. If there's anything in your life, in your body, that you are not enjoying right now, you have the power to change it. So remember, stress kills, optimism heals. OK, I got five more minutes. OK. Um, in 2010, my, we were sitting around watching uh, one of the games in the World Cup of Soccer in, in, in 2010. It was held in South Africa. And we found out that the next World Cup was going to be in Brazil. I don't know how many of you are big sports fans here, but I am a big soccer fan. And, and my oldest son and I love Brazil. Okay? We love Brazil. And so we looked at each other and we said, we're going. We're going to this. My, my husband and my younger son, not so much. But we said, this is going to be a family trip. And so 2013 comes up. It's time to apply for the lottery. The ticket lottery, according to FIFA's numbers, more than 11 million people applied for just over 3 million tickets. Stiff competition, wouldn't you say? Because there are no guarantees that you're going to get these. My, so I applied, my son applied, and of course this is about a year after his concussion. Okay? So, we decided, we had a family meeting, okay, where are we going to go? We're going to skip the group stage of 32 teams. We'll go to the playoffs. We're going to go to Fortaleza, which is 30, 30 degrees Celsius almost all year round because it's winter time in South America. And we're going to, we want to find a place near the beach. So we got the flights. We found the apartment. We paid for everything up front by October. And we had no idea which teams were going to play each other because they weren't even going to pick the, the teams in their groups until November, no, December of 2013. But we've already paid for everything. We are going whether we get tickets or not. Come November, my son has won his eight tickets. Okay. And then we went and invited some equally soccer crazy fan friends of ours who were expats, and we met them down in Fortaleza. So here we are in June at Sao Paulo Airport after a 10 hour overnight flight from Toronto and on our way to Fortaleza, which is another two and a half hours north. And here we are with our good friends, some of them at the game, and that was the thing. We, both families cheer for Holland and we cheer for Brazil. The playoff game, the first playoff game that we saw was between Holland and Mexico, Holland won. The second game that we saw, again, a playoff game, we had no idea who was going to be there, Brazil versus Colombia, we won. It was the most amazing holiday that was so perfect. This is my son, Nolan, my very tall son, Nolan. I guarantee you, if he had not had dealt with his concussion the way he had, he would not have had the presence and the strength of mind to do what he did, was to make this vacation come true. So this afternoon, we're going to start 
showing you how to become stronger and more self-assured again to deal with any crisis now and in the future. See you this afternoon, and thank you very much. <laughs>